Okay, good evening and welcome to our first uh, webinar in our 2021 breeding series. So I'm Rebecca from Kentucky Equine Research and tonight I'm joined by a few other members of our Australian based technical and nutrition teams. So first up we have Dr Peter Huntington who will be taking us through tonight's presentation on optimising fertility and the subfertile horse. Uh, Peter is our veterinarian and director of nutrition at Kentucky Equine Research. We also have David Nash, um, who is the Director of Nutrition Technology, and uh, Dr. Clarissa Brown-Douglas, who is a long-standing nutritionist with Kentucky Equine Research. Um, and both of these guys will join us for our Q&A panel discussion at the conclusion of Peter's presentation. So just before we get started, um, please feel free to ask any questions you would like to throughout the presentation via the Q&A box, um, and we'll do our best to get through all of those uh, later this evening. Um, and for anyone that's watching the replay of this, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at advice at kr.com and one of our panellists will respond to you directly. So uh, with that, I will hand over to Pete um, to get started on his presentation. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Rebecca's surname's Ham too, if you need to know that. <laughs> she always tries to remain an relatively anonymous. So uh, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Um, Hopefully everyone's had a glass of red wine. Um, I see there's a couple of um, some people there in New Zealand, so it's getting a bit late, uh, later for you. And uh, we've got some people from uh, different places around the world. So I want to talk about um, factors that can impact on fertility and some of the things that you can do with perhaps a subfertile horse uh, to improve it. And we'll cover both the, uh, the mare and the stallion. Um, and, uh, so. We were pretty good. We got pretty good at these terms last year. This is the first one for a little while. So uh, uh, hopefully I can get it all to work. So good nutrition. The, the horse is interesting. You know, most other animals, production animals, are selected for fertility. And the horse really isn't selected for fertility. They're selected on uh, performance, uh, pedigree, and, uh, and uh, potential, lots of other factors. So, um, you know, many of the horses uh, that we're breeding with are subfertile in various ways. Um, uh, you don't see too many, um, you know, they get lots of chances before they uh, leave the breeding herd. So nutrition of the mare in particular can make a big difference to fertility as well as the health and uh, welfare and performance of the foal. Uh, so that's a, a key factor. Um, in contrast, and I think, you know, that's an area I want to concentrate on because, I think, you know, we can make the most difference with the mare. Um, stallion feeding is often made way too complicated. But if you've got a subfertile horse, then nutrition can make a difference to the subfertile horse. And obviously with the, the size of the books uh, that stallions cover, uh, particularly those that are collected for AI, then, um, you know, one or, one or two extra pregnancies uh, is very valuable. So uh, you can make a big difference to uh, the, um, the returns the breeder has uh, with some improvements in fertility. Starting out with mares, I think the key thing with mares and, and the key thing with stallions and all horses is keep them in the right body condition and body weight. Um, unfortunately, mare owners often demand horses that look like, you know, they want horses that look like show horses. Um, so uh, with... Uh, you know, gleaming coats all year round. We, um, you know, it doesn't matter if uh, they have a, a winter coat. Uh, as long as they lose that winter coat, um, start to lose it uh, when uh, they're coming into the breeding season, because that's usually associated with the sort of first, um, the first uh, fertile um, estrus period. So most mares, other animal industries have this thing called flushing, where um, the um, animals that they're trying to mate, they try and get them a little skinny and then put weight on them. And I think this is um, only relevant if, if the horse is skinny to begin with. Uh, so if you've got a light conditioned maiden mare or an older mare that's lost weight, fed a big foal and uh, produced masses of milk and they're, they're very light, then yeah, you do want to flush them and, 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 and see an increase in body condition score. But for... Uh, the average good doing mare, that's not essential. So you certainly don't want to drive weight loss so they can put it back on. I think it's um, certainly okay to see ribs in mares and uh, they can be very fertile in, in that sort of condition. Um, the biggest thing you've got going for you, if you, if you have it, is green grass. 
and um, so uh, plenty of that in most parts of, uh, of Australia at the moment. Um, it's always there in New Zealand, um, or nearly always there, uh, certainly in the North Island. And, and that has a lot of benefits for the mayor. Um, high in energy, lots of good protein and amino acids will supply more than the, uh, the need for fertility. Good levels of omega-3 fatty acids, some vitamins that are important in fertility. Um, vitamin K uh, uh, is, is uh, also important in bone. That's all there in high levels in green grass, full of antioxidants and, and other factors that we really can't define. So you get much better results if you can feed the horse with a significant part of its dietary intake being green grass than if you replace that with sort of hay or haylage. Now, in some circumstances, um, you haven't got a choice, but uh, you'll get better results if, uh, if you can use what's, uh, what's natural and green. So getting the energy supply right is the key thing uh, with, I think, uh, with maintaining the mare fertility to be the best it can be. Uh, so, um, you know, if you've got old mares that have had 10 foals and lots of damage to the the cervix or the uterus or something like that, um, poor biopsy scores, then yeah, getting the energy supply right and maintaining them in the right body condition may not make that much difference. But um, if you've got a fertile horse, then you want to have them in the, in the right sort of condition. So we can either look at um, weighing mares after foaling, and I think this is a good management tool because uh, weight changes are obviously detectable sooner than you can see it with a body condition score loss. But most of you don't have that facility. Now, obviously, if you've got mares after foaling, they'll lose an active amount of weight when they foal, but then you want them to try and maintain that weight afterwards. And so if you are weighing them and they're starting to drop, drop weight, then you can increase the feed uh, to, uh, to compensate increased energy supply. So negative energy balance, they'll lose weight. We're really trying to avoid that. If you can't, then you've got a body condition score them and you're looking at uh, three parts of the horse. You're looking at particularly the rump of the horse from the side and behind, um, the back and ribs and, uh, and the neck and looking on the side of the horse, uh, you know, not over the mane. And you can use that as the basis for adjusting uh, energy intake using either grain or, or forage. So two systems of body condition scoring that I'm sure you're all familiar with, the Aussie one, uh, of zero to five, and we want to keep our mares sort of between three and four in this scale. We're not getting over that. And the Henneke system that was designed around uh, quarter horse mares in the US, so we wanted to keep them, you know, between sort of five and seven, probably no, no heavier than that. Uh, certainly, um, there's some, some real disadvantages in getting them too heavy, and uh, you start to get some disadvantages when you, when you, uh, Get, um, get to the situation with thin mares. So when mares have got a body condition score less than two, and this is usually in the Australian system, uh, research has shown that they may have uh, longer gestation, so you've got less time to get them back in foal and still um, uh, you know, maintain an early foaling date if that's important, um, longer intraovulatory periods and lower pregnancy rate. Um, and will also potentially have a difference on the uh, birth weight of the foal and, and its value. So uh, we've, we're trying to avoid that. In some horses, uh, you can't help it because of uh, either um, just their metabolism or, or disease, uh, And um, but uh, we would certainly try to avoid it. Now, you go to the other extreme, and what about the fat mare? And this may sort of seem superficially attractive, but um, you get very fat mares. You don't have a big effect on the size of the foal. Um, you'll certainly get more difficult foalings, and big foals will uh, often uh, often leave you with more damage to the reproductive tract that makes it harder to get uh, mares in foal. Uh, you'll have more bent legs in those foals and more, more risk of them going upright. You've got the risk of laminitis in the mare. Um, mares in uh, pregnancy tend to be less insulin sensitive anyway. So if you add that, uh, add to that your obesity and reduce insulin sensitivity, you can increase the risk of laminitis. And there's some research showing uh, uh, lower milk production with very fat mares and negative impacts on the quality of the colostrum. Um, so one of the studies, this was a study done in England looking at um, uh, feeding pregnant mares and uh, 
was feeding, uh, they were made in mares and, and were fed to maintain them or to have them foaling in, in two different body condition scores. Uh, there wasn't any difference in when they fold and they were either five to six, so they were in good body condition score or seven to eight, so they were fat horses. Um, no difference in pregnancy rate. Uh, certainly they had a risk of laminitis, the, um, the, the fat group, and um, the feed bill was twice as big. So that's, uh, most people regard that as being detrimental. Now, sometimes you've got horses like this one on the slide that um, I don't think it did much moving around the paddock. And, you know, one of the drawbacks of, um, of ad-lib supply of hay is that some mares just stay there and, and, and they eat, you know, 15 hours a day. Um, and so you can have them in uh, really good shape at the end, too good shape. So if, you're, if you've got the mare grazing, at least they're moving. So research has shown that uh, grazing mare or grazing horses can move sort of seven or seven kilometres or so a day. And uh, so they're using up some energy doing that. And uh, whereas if you've got the mare standing around the, uh, the hay rack all day and it's high energy hay, then they can get to look like this mare. Um, so other studies have um, shown uh, different um, cyclical changes or uh, uh, estrus cycles that, that aren't uh, well synchronised or, or, uh, or regulated, um, changes in follicle development, uh, endometrial health, and uh, reduced um, increased embryonic loss. So uh, some, some negatives in the mare that's, uh, the mare that's too heavy, definitely. Um, what about birth weight? Um, as well as the impact of a very high birth weight on increased risk of legal disease with uh, things like um, upright foals, angle limb deformities and, um, and sloughal OCD, there's also a greater risk of dystocia. And uh, this was a UK study with thoroughbreds. Um, mares that had very big foals, the 62 kilo and above, which is, uh, they're pretty big foals, the average of 55. Um, their following uh, percentage the following year was lower um, and they took more cycles uh, to get in foals. So that sort of relates to the uh, potential damage to the reproductive tract. Now, what about dry mares? Um, uh, what are we doing there? Poor body condition score mares have got a longer winter and estrus period and often they'll have, uh, have a, a coat and their coat, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll hang on to the winter coat longer. And that's a bit of a sign. Once they lose the winter coat, you sign that the uh, reproductive tract's getting into the, into the right shape. Um, body condition scores less than two and a half, two and a half delayed uh, first ovulation and lower pregnancy rates. And um, I think if you are trying to put weight on mares, uh, you really do get a big impact from uh, pasture. So uh, the uh, Twink Allen and New Zealand uh, Veterinarian who was an equine uh, reproduction expert just died recently. Unfortunately, he was um, he coined this term Dr. Green, and I think it's a very apt one. Um, you've probably got to be careful with maiden mares, uh, especially when they get there late, because uh, they aren't used to competing with other mares in the pa in, in the mob. If they're being fed uh, in groups in the paddock, if they're being fed individually, that's a different story, uh, and you've usually got to feed them extra and avoid the pecking order effects. And often they need to be fed um, sort of intakes of concentrate that are more akin to what they got when they're performing than what the rest of the mares get on the farm. Um, so horses that are racing in particular have got lowered uh, digestive and metabolic efficiency. And that's why you need to feed them so much to maintain their condition. Um, they're, uh, it's been a while since they've been in groups usually. They might get there when they're spelling uh, and they they may uh, may remember what it was like when they were uh, when they were weanlings and yearlings, uh, but they're not used to really being in groups or or pecking orders. And uh, mares can be really difficult. I think one of the things about managing mares is always to, if they're in a group, always to have an extra feeder um, so that the pecking order effects uh, are, are, are minimised and the feeder should be located in a circle rather than in a straight line. Um, all groups are, are really uh, beneficial for these sort of mares. So uh, if you've got, um, I mean, I guess we're seeing increasingly uh, the use of, of lights, um, 
lights on the individual horse rather than um, putting mares under lights going into stables. But if you do, if they do go into stables, then you've got the chance to feed them individually. And one of the mistakes people can make in putting mares under lights is that they don't give them enough hay overnight. So they really should be on uh, on the ad lib hay, particularly. Now, lactating mares, uh, we've got a massive increase in, in uh, their energy, protein and amino acid needs, as well as their mineral needs. And, and that relates to how much milk they're making. So they can be making, um, you know, three, three and a half, maybe 4% of their body weight in milk each day. And so that means that their energy and protein uh, requirements often double. And this uh, means to maintain their body condition, we're often, often needing high concentrate intakes, as well as lots of high quality forage. Now, um, if you feed, uh, if you've got mares in yards, and often they're in yards for the first uh, nine or 10 days to give the uh, foal's legs a chance to straighten up and uh, reduce the uh, amount of running around the foal does at that stage, then, um, and there's not much there, or coming to the end of the season, and you're feeding those mares that lib, you, you'll know how much hay they'll eat. Uh, but if it's earlier in the year and the grass is there, then uh, that's a really important part of getting them back and maintaining uh, their body condition. Obviously, you do get some uh, individual differences, but it's really important to avoid major weight loss at this stage for both fertility and also later on for milk production, because if you get major weight loss, the um, uh, foal wells are slow. Uh, have uh, reduced growth. At either end of the spectrum, the winter and the summer foaling mares, they're going to have a reduced energy and protein intake from pasture. And so in these situations, you've got to offer them more hay. And the hay should be, um, you know, higher protein, uh, higher energy hay. So lucerne or alfalfa is, is usually the preferred one or a, um, a really high quality grass hay, perhaps with some other legumes mixed in like clover. Um, if they're in yards um, and stables, it really ought to be how much they want to eat uh, rather than, uh, you know, just doing the calculations because these mares, you know, may want uh, one and a half, um, two percent of their body weight in forage. So uh, when you calculate that out, if you're a uh, 550 kilo uh, uh, mare, um, then, um, you, you know, you've got uh, half a bale of hay that they're needing a day and certainly would need more hard feed, more concentrates, and higher energy concentrates, higher protein concentrates at this time of their cycle. Now, weight loss during lactation will definitely affect reproductive efficiency. No one's really studied um, how much it needs to be before they know that effect, and you'll only know that really if you're weighing, if you're weighing the mare, because minor weight losses won't be apparent to you looking at body condition score. So you've got the the, um, the next pregnancy, development of the next pregnancy, and it's more really about the conception rate or the potential influence on em early embryonic loss. And it's also about milk production. Um, I think sort of 20 kilos a month weight loss is probably a significant one for foal growth rate, but that's just sort of based on the observation of lots of mere um, mere data about mare weights and, and foal weights. And uh, as I mentioned, the mare that's confined because the foals had surgery or um, something like that, or is, is got an eye problem or is sick, then they certainly need large amounts of uh, forage to replace what they could be eating out in the paddock. Now, what about some of the specifics sort of dialing down into some of the micronutrients and, um, and their potential influence on fertility? Um, antioxidants are a group um, of uh, compounds in the body that combat these things called reactive ox oxygen species uh, that avoids oxidative stress and damage to tissues. And that damage uh, from the reactive ox ox oxidative ROS can result in things like DNA damage um, or can damage uh, other, other cell membranes and um, lead to uh, reduced fertility. It certainly appears to be in high levels of uh, reactive oxidative species. Um, you're getting um, uh, increased risk of uh, early embryonic loss or, or uh, fetal growth retardation. Um, and there's been a number of studies looking at this, but one of the more recent ones uh, showed that uh, older mares uh, with reduced fertility um, and they had a diet supplemented with uh, both 
the long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil and uh, an antioxidant cocktail had improved oocyte function and embryo development compared to using uh, something using one where corn oil, which was uh, it had high levels of omega-6, was around. Now, uh, there's a number of antioxidants um, that are present in the body and uh, some nutrients are uh, key parts of some of those antioxidants and, and one of the important ones there is selenium. So that's important uh, as part of antioxidant, antioxidant uh, uh, function in the body uh, and it's got several roles. It's certainly got roles in growth and reproduction and immune response. And one of the key things here is that many um, areas uh, where horses are kept are quite low in selenium. So we need, need, uh, we need extra selenium. You know, most of New Zealand is very low, uh, the Hunter Valley low, some coastal areas uh, down through Victoria, uh, Western Australia, low in selenium. And yet there are also areas that are high in selenium uh, and you can get, um, you can get reduced immunity. Uh, you can get a thing called white muscle disease in foals if they're very low um, and, um, so, but uh, you can get toxicity, which leads to sort of wolf damage in particular and hair falling out in certain parts of the world or through excessive supplementation. So selenium, um, you've got to assess what's, know what's really in the pasture or in the forage and also then what you're getting in the concentrates and whether you need, then need to look at adding some supplementation. But the selenium is one thing you, you want to be concerned about. And uh, it is one that uh, you can actually, one of the rare nutrients that we can do a blood test and assess the status of the horse. So, I mean, there's not many of them that, that that's appropriate, uh, but it, it, uh, selenium is one that we can do to assess the status of the horse. Um, vitamin E is a, uh, another important nutrient that is another antioxidant and it works in sort of cooperatively with selenium so if we've got a mild uh, deficiency of selenium the extra vitamin e can help make up for the functions of selenium uh, vitamin e you can also measure in the blood but it's not done very commonly in uh, the southern hemisphere anyway is more commonly in, in the u.s um, we know you get really high levels in green grass, but the levels will drop dramatically uh, when it's made into hay or, or the grass dries off. And uh, you get variable levels uh, in feeds. When I started in this game, uh, vitamin E was really expensive and we had very low levels in feeds and it cost us a lot to put it in. Now it's become, um, become much more affordable, so you'll see larger amounts in feeds. Um, natural vitamin E better than synthetic vitamin E. Uh, we get uh, much greater bioavailability. But supplementation of the female with vitamin E and organic selenium has been shown to improve fertility, and that's thought to be related to the conditions in the overduct. So uh, overduct uh, where the sperm have to sit and wait for uh, ovulation. So um, They'll be uh, happier little campers um, if um, the antioxidant status of the mare can be improved with some vitamin E or organic selenium. Um, so I mentioned omega-3 fatty acids, and this is long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about this in context of the mares, but also in the context of the stallion. And there's, is, there's all the time there's more information about the benefits of these fatty acids in our diet. Um, and uh, for us, it's probably eating fish uh, or taking fish oil tablets. Horses don't get the chance to eat, uh, to eat fish very often. So uh, we're gonna make do with uh, fish oil supplementation if we're wanting to get these long chain omega-3 fatty acids into the diet. And they're, um, they're uh, taken up preferentially uh, by different parts of the reproductive tract. And there's been some research in a number of animals showing uh, reduced embryonic loss, uh, improvements in blood flow to the placenta, then improving nutrient supply, uh, the anti-inflammatory effects that can have an imp impact on placentitis, and um, blocking release of prostaglandins, so uh, the sensitivity of the corpus luteum, the prostaglandins, so that you get this, uh, you, you get uh, reduced risk of, uh, of a pregnancy that's already there dropping out. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the sort of test at the end of the session uh, with the uh, pathways from omega-6 fatty acids, which are in, in the red pathway here, and the common uh, 18 carbon uh, through to the pro-inflammatory side of the equation, arachidonic acid, 
or some thromboxanes and prostaglandins. And then on the other side, the omega-3 pathway where we, um, we start with that in carbon, um, alpha linolenic acid, and uh, that goes through to these active uh, omega-3, long chain omega-3s, the EPA and DHA. And there's a real roadblock at this point here because the same um, enzymes are used to metabolize the, uh, the omega-6s and the omega-3s. So there's a certain roadblock in getting from the 18 carbon ones here that present in high levels and say something like linseed oil um, through to the active um, uh, EPA and DHA. And I'll show some data on that shortly. Um, so different oils have got different uh, ratios, different types of oil in them, different ratios. And it's, it's very confusing because the marketing on, on just about all oils will say, oh, yes, it's sort of got lots of omega-3 fatty acids as well. Some of them have got a, a lot and uh, some uh, don't have so many. And mostly it's the uh, short chain ones. And then you've got this roadblock stopping them uh, getting through to the long chain forms biologically active. So high omega-6 to 3 ratio, uh, corn oil, sunflower oil, rice bran oil, that might be good in certain circumstances, might be useful in gastric ulcers, in, um, in uh, reduced um, acid secretion, gastric ulcers, some data about that, uh, but uh, it's probably less useful in most other areas of, of the horse's uh, health welfare. Moderate ratios of soybean and canola oil. So if you're wanting an oil for energy with a reasonable uh, ratio of uh, six to threes, not too many sixes, then canola oil is quite a good one. High levels of omega-3 and low sixes are in linseed or flax oil, as they call it in some parts of the country, of the world. But the ones that have the high levels of the long chain active important omega-3s, the EPA and the DHA, is fish oil. And uh, so if you wanted to get those directly into the horse, then you've got to uh, give your horse some fish oil. Now, the drawback is fish oil is not the most palatable oil. It's probably no surprise to any of you who've taken uh, fish oil tablets um, or, um, or some other, you know, cod liver oil or other things like that um, over the years. Um, and um, so, uh, but it, it really um, does have some, some major benefits and fertility is one area where it does that. Also has uh, significant benefits in the lungs of the horse, anti-inflammatory effects uh, recommended for equine asthma uh, cases and uh, great for skins, allergic skins. And there's a few other situations as well. But this is sort of some of the research that's been um, conducted uh, looking at the impact of uh, DHA and EPA supplementation largely using fish oil and apologies for the typo in the uh, in the title there. Um, so it's been shown that we can increase the levels of, of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids in the endometrium as well as in the blood. So it's, we actually know it's getting into the tissues, can have an impact on gene expression um, for things that are potentially damaging to pregnancy or uh, increased risk of pregnancy loss, prostaglandin mediators, interleukins, um, has resulted in better biopsy scores, um, measured reductions and significant reductions in uh, the uh, inflammatory response after breeding and, and fluid accumulation, as well as upregulating uh, up gene expression. Uh, changes in, in progesterone levels, uh, which is um, progesterone obviously uh, important for maintenance of pregnancy. Um, in a foaling situation, improvement in uh, ovarian blood flow and faster involution of the gravid horn. So uh, that may um, reduce one of the uh, one of the considerations about getting the mare back in foal. And what significantly really is higher cycle pregnancy rates. So his study showing uh, it, it didn't have to cover the mare as many times to uh, to get um, to get a pregnancy. So that's uh, really beneficial. Um, so why might you use omega-3 fatty acids, given that um, it's not something you're going to get in the feed itself? You, if you're going to use fish oil, you've really got to add it. Um, and that's difficult if you're feeding groups, um, unless you're feeding the whole group or you want to squirt it into the mare's mouth. Uh, but anti-inflammatory effects for mares that are prone to early embryonic loss, prone to placentitis or fetal loss. Um, there is also some, some suggestions that giving them prior to foaling 
were influenced the fatty acid uh, content of the milk and may have some beneficial effects in the foal. But the main thing would be your 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 worry about uh, placentitis. If you had mares prone to placentitis or mares prone to early embryonic loss, that you could do that. Now, green grass is also going to have a useful effect, but you do not get the same effect from vegetable oils such as uh, linseed and canola. And this slide um, shows the reason why. So what we've got is that um, both uh, the linoleic and alpha-linolenic acid, the 18 carbon forms, must be elongated to a 20 and 22 carbon uh, form in the body. And they're using this competition for a shared uh, enzyme. So it's um, much better to uh, supply the DHA and EPA which are these forms here, uh, rather than rely on, um, on uh, reduce the competition of the enzyme. So here's some research we did recently looking at the EPA and DHA levels in red blood cells, comparing um, a fish oil and a vegetable source of omega-3 that had the same amounts of, of, of omega-3, but it was the short chain form. And you can see at the start of the study, 120 day study, um, and at uh, the start of the study, the uh, they were two groups were the same, and at the end of the uh, massive difference in the uh, the levels of EPA as a percentage of total fatty acids and also DHA. So showing that really, and that the horses that were getting the the limpid oil mix, um, there was no difference. So uh, uh, no significant difference. The only significant difference was uh, when you were giving the fish oil. So is there hope for aging broodmares? Yes, omega-3 fatty acids might, uh, might provide that in, in certain circumstances, depending on the, you know, the reason that they, they're becoming subfertile. Now, uh, switching from fatty acids to amino acids, uh, then arginine is uh, an essential amino acid and involved in the function of a number of body systems. And there have been a number of studies in production animals uh, particularly that have shown um, changes to uh, blood flow and uh, improvements in fetal birth weight and survival rate. Um, sal, if that's the case. Um, and it's a potential supplement that could be given to uh, problem mares to improve conception rates and, uh, and survival. So some of the research that's been done in horses, um, and this, one of the drawbacks is you've got to give 100 grams of this of arginine. So uh, you've got 100 grams of powder to get into the horse because that's the only only way of doing it at the moment, um, and and be the expense. But if you've got a valuable mare, then um, then that may be worth it. Uh, so when given for 21 days before foaling, um, we um, uh, led to, and I think I've got. Um, I've got these things, my uh, arrows are around the wrong way. So here we had um, lower uh, uterine fluid accumulation and increased uterine blood flow. So arrows are around the wrong way there. Sorry about that. Um, fed to uh, 12 mares in a, in a group over three cycles and then the mares were, uh, had a control group and oxytocin group. Um, they were given a one litre fluid infusion when they were um, had a decent sized follicle and there was a trend to reduce uterine fluid accumulation. So reduce fluid accumulation in the arginine group. Um, here's a study where 75 grams of arginine was given to, uh, to mares uh, from day 15 to 45 and had increased embryo size at day 40 in those mares. Uh, when there were no difference in the embryo size at, at day 15. Yeah. Um, 100 grams of arginine and improvements in, in foal birth weight. And, and that may be relevant uh, to say, uh, you know, maiden or older mares uh, or mares that historically give you, uh, give you small foals and in circumstances where you want a larger one where it's economically valuable. Now, what about something that's sort of potentially negative that might be there in the environment anyway? And this is potentially negative, but I'll mention phytoestrogens, um, which are estrogen-like compounds. Um, and in legumes, they're certainly shown to affect fertility in sheep and cattle. Um, and they can come into the horse's environment through lutein or some types of clover. And it's thought that um, subclover cultivars can certainly have high levels. Um, the uh, white clover, the, the perennial clovers, 
generally or leucine generally have little phytoestrogens unless they're suffering uh, disease or attacked by pathogens. Um, and it's thought that the phytoestrogens work by stimulating prostaglandin production. But if you've got mares that have sort of disruption of normal cycles or they're failing to ovulate, and you've got them grazing uh, so clover or lutein, then you may want to consider that. And it, it is something that can be tested. So uh, there's some, some groups. Now, as we keep mares um, breeding longer, we're going to see more mares with metabolic issues. This is actually a nanny, so she was retired from breeding. Uh, but uh, you look at the long, uh, the long coat and you go, yeah, she's most likely to have some level of, of PPID or equine Cushing's. Um, and uh, that certainly can result in reduced fertility. There's an effective drug, pergolite, uh, to uh, treat, uh, treat PPID. You've got to seek veterinary advice. There's some potential drawbacks about reduced appetite, uh, increased risk of, of not making milk. Um, hypoglactia or agalactia, so nurse mares may be required and may also uh, increase the risk of pro prolonged gestation, etc. So there's some potential side effects, but there's some, some benefits too in getting some of these older mares in terms of improvement in fertility. So uh, there's some recommendations around managing mares in that circumstance about discontinuing it um, before foaling as long as uh, you don't get a risk of laminitis associated with it because laminitis is one of the potential uh, side effects um, from uh, PPID. Um, and then if necessary, you know, monitoring the foal uh, closely and, and seeing how foals, the weight gain in the foal or, or what you can do about measuring assessing milk production, because you can be looking at the bag in the mare, but uh, looking at weight gain will be the best guide, and if necessary, supplementing the foal, or perhaps putting it on a, on a nurse mare. Um, and uh, so it's, um, you know, there are some um, situations, you know, maybe uh, using the mare as an embryo donor might be a better, better shot if you're in a breed that can uh, have that as an option. Um, some of these mares may also have insulin dysregulation and be at risk of laminitis, and they also need to be, uh, you need to look at the appropriate body condition score and fed a diet that's sort of lower in uh, non-structural carbohydrates, higher in fat and fire, lower glycemic um, index to reduce the risk of, um, of uh, getting laminitis. So the summary with mare nutrition is we really want straight line nutrition. So we're sort of tending to maintain the mare in the same body condition throughout the year. And body condition uh, is one of the key factors. Maiden mares certainly need to gain weight, um, uh, often need to gain weight. Uh, you don't want um, mares going off feed and getting too much weight loss in pregnancy, but the pregnancy tends to be protected. Uh, you get substantial weight loss, it may have a different uh, uh, not so much in abortion, but in, in growth of the foal. And one of the key areas is avoiding weight loss after foaling. And considering uh, in subfertile horses, antioxidants pre-foaling, if you've got uh, green grass in an area with plenty of selenium in the soil, you'll, you'll be getting that if they're uh, getting to eat grass like the mare in this paddock. Um, but in other situations, you've got to supplement it and omega-3 uh, fatty acids and arginine are beneficial. Now, moving gear to stallions, um, the stallion, you know, in general, stallion feeding is made more complicated than it needs to be. And I think, uh, you know, stallions, um, obviously, uh, the, the, uh, until they're a proven stallion in a, in a particular uh, breed, you know, the, the value of, um, of a service or a straw uh, is dictated by how they look. And uh, so often uh, fatness is one of the, uh, the early aims with the, with the young stallion. Uh, so that, um, you know, mare owners um, can be seduced into thinking what great muscle the horse had when in fact it's probably just got some extra, extra body fat um, uh, there. So um, there's, uh, that's one of the considerations. Um, and obviously shuttle stallions is more challenging or AI stallions, uh, you know, doing large numbers of mares. But, you know, with, um, in thoroughbreds with the, incidentally in the Southern Hemisphere, shorter breeding season and the need to make you know, four uh, four times a day, then libido libido and fertility do become you know very important. The um, breeding during the breeding season, uh, you get about a twenty five increase uh, percent increase in in 
requirements for most nutrients. So you're going to feed the horse more. Um, but generally, people often overestimate the energy requirements of stallions. And, and that's one of the reasons why many are, are overweight. Um, some stallions, if they're in a paddock, are very active, walk, walk and run up and down the fence. Some are, some are very active and use more energy in the, in the covering barn. Um, but others just uh, uh, take it in their stride, and if they're not covering for a day, um, they can uh, do it very well without much of an increase in the amount you feed them. And fat stallions, there's a number of negatives to them. Harder to get fit, uh, increased chance of injury, laminitis, more chance of colic. Biggest killer of uh, stallions is, is um, obesity. So I think avoid that if you can. Now, the... Um, Stallions should all be fed as individuals, clearly, and it's going to depend on, on you know, how many mares they're covering, their breed, their age, their behaviour, what body condition you've got originally, and, uh, uh, you know, those sort of considerations, how much exercise uh, they take in the paddock or how much you're giving them is going to impact on it. So individual feeding. You probably want them coming into the breeding season uh, not too heavy. I'd sort of, you'd like them to come in more body condition score six or say three and a half uh, rather than uh, seven, but the temptation is to get them uh, get them looking like that. Um, independently, I think it's great if you can see some ribs in a stadium, that's a good sign. Um, or if not, then the fat over the ribs need to feel spongy. Um, so establishing the ideal weight um, is important. And if you've got scales and you can weigh, stallion, weigh the stallion, then weighing them weekly throughout the breeding season is a good management tool. Because again, you can pick up changes in body weight before you would pick them up by the eye. So the basics of feeding the stallion um, should be built around you know, good quality forage. Um, you, often you can't feed it ad lib. Can't feed hay or lift some stallions because they're going to get too heavy, but uh, some pasture, uh, something to graze on in their paddock, and uh, then some supplementary hay when they're when they're in the box, um, and then a balanced concentrate uh, used to balance the rations. So you can often, you know, stallions can be fed um, on a balanced pellet and and hay and pasture during the non-breeding season. And there'd be some breeds of stallion who could stay like that in the breeding season, but most will need some uh, concentrates um, with um, some extra energy uh, to help um, help them uh, maintain body weight in the face of uh, a sort of big book of mares. Omega-3 fatty acids is beneficial, and I'll come to those in a, in a second. So during the uh, off season, uh, make sure you reduce the feed, and many times they can be on... Uh, Good quality hay and or grazing and a balancer and that the balancer is needed so you can supply uh, levels of trace minerals and vitamins that are uh, part of the horse's uh, nutrient requirements. Now what about some of the nutritional assistance that we can have? We've mentioned omega-3 fatty acids in uh, uh, relation to mares and the long chain omega-3 fatty acids so uh, uh, the benefits of those. So we've got the same sort of things here. There's been a number of studies done looking at supplementing um, stallions with EPA and DHA. So this was a study done uh, in Texas, 60 grams of fish oil for 100 days in a crossover study. They got an increase in serum DHA levels and uh, increases in, um, in sperm concentration or motility. And this was mo when either it was fresh, uh, cooled for 24 hours, or frozen. So it was sort of robust increases in uh, motility and uh, sperm concentration in those circumstances. Um, in a poor motility group, uh, you're probably getting greater benefits there. So uh, in this group, this is the progressive motility. So you had a, had a good motility group there, and and there wasn't, you know, in a fresh, it wasn't too wasn't too big a difference. There were, that, in fact, no difference. Um, where we have an asterisk, then that means there is a significant difference. So uh, cooling for 48 hours or freezing it uh, puts semen under more stress. So we have lower motility uh, when, we, when we take it out afterwards. Um, or in the poor motility group, even with 24 hours of cooling, we were getting a, we were seeing a significant effect there and a significant effect 48 hours. So, with all of these things, if you've got a, um, a subfertile stallion, then you're going to pay more attention to some of the potential aids here. 
Um, so another study looked at giving um, 30 grams of uh, EPA and DHA, which equates to 120 mils of fish oil for 90 days or a controlled diet. Uh, we got a significant increase in the levels of EPA and DHA in the plasma and in the sperm uh, membranes and uh, a 50% of significant increase in daily sperm output. So another study showing the benefit there. And there are several um, steps in the sperm maturation process and fertilization where uh, reactive oxidative species are produced in large numbers and they can damage sperm cells or decrease motility. Uh, the damage can be damaged to the DNA if the horse's antioxidant defenses are, are depleted. In fact, um, equine sperm has very high levels of reactive oxidative species, all related around the motility. Uh, so it's very motile stuff. Those of you who looked under the microscope will see that, uh, highly motile. And so we've got high levels in, in equine sperm. Uh, so making a potential uh, need for a robust antioxidant system greater. So oxidative stress, stress uh, to the sperm will lower motility, just as temperature shock will lower motility. So, and you all know about maintaining, uh, maintaining temperature and avoiding temperature stock, shock on, uh, on sperm. So um, some of the studies done looking at uh, combinations of uh, antioxidants and the long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids, they appear to be synergistic. So a Brazilian study, uh, found a significant increase in motility um, as well as membrane integrity in sperm um, kept under various conditions. And uh, there was synergistic effect um, of, um, of the long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids and the antioxidants, L-carnitine and selenium on the kinetics, so the motility and viability, et cetera, of sperm. Um, study in Kentucky, University looked at one where we've got some organic selenium, some vitamin E, um, and uh, 30 grams of the long chain um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the EPA and DHA. So again, you've got quite a big dose of fish oil to get that. Um, six treated, six controlled horses, and increases in total and progressive motility or significant increases. So um, it's a, a number of reasons why uh, you should be thinking about um, unsaturated fatty acids or a number of research studies showing you to do that and uh, the impact on, on the sperm uh, sperm motility in particular and, and viability. Now selenium, um, we mentioned in the context of mares, thought to be particularly important of uh, for testicular function and antioxidant status and um, insufficient dietary selenium can lead to lower fertility. Um, and because of changes in the horse's DNA. Um, and the selenium concentration of horse sperm has been correlated with uh, motility levels and fertility rates. So um, now because of the relatively narrow range between requirements and toxicity, you've got to pay a bit more attention to um, how, how the selenium is getting into the horse. But again, as I mentioned, it is one that you can measure as well or alternatively get some of the nutritional calculations done by nutritionists like us. Um, vitamin E for stallions, many stallions are giving because uh, they get less grass than um, less grazing than many other horses on the farm. They probably have a greater vitamin E and uh, a vitamin E need and working stallions are thought to have a sort of, they need probably 50% more or so uh, vitamin E uh, in their diet compared to a resting horse. Um, and because horses are in boxes often for a lot of the time or they don't have green pasture, then um, giving a stallion supplementary vitamin E is, is, a, is a common practice. And uh, bioavailability is the key. And the key there is a natural source of vitamin E to do it. So some research done um, at um, Erica G and uh, who's now at Matthew University. I think this was done in... Uh, the US. So uh, she gave 3,000 IU of natural vitamin E for 14 weeks to a group of subfertile horses. Um, no change in post thorn motility, but improved motility in uh, semen when it was uh, chilled compared to uh, 48 hours um, chilled. And that, that's one of the, uh, you know, the more challenging areas, as those of you who are involved in, um, in AI will know. And a mixed antioxidant 
oxygen supplement led to improved pathology, uh, but no change in, in, in motility. So another study, uh, vitamin E was the key component of that. Now, what about a, a nutrient that we haven't um, paid much attention to until just recently, and that's coenzyme Q10. Um, and uh, coenzyme Q10 is, is a natural substance in the body. It's in the mitochondria. Um, and it's an, another important antioxidant. So it's important for energy production in the mitochondria. And as the equine sperm uses um, vast amounts of oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP to, um, to do its job as tadpoles, then uh, coenzyme Q10 level in the mitochondria is thought to be important. And that motility um, really can lead to increased oxidative stress. So it's got two important roles. Uh, one is assisting energy production and the second then combating the results of the energy production because the, re the reactive oxidative stress can lead to uh, you know, DNA damage, um, protein and membrane damage, and then reduced uh, motility and sperm viability. Um, it's been used as a supplement in subfertile men, um, as well as a supplement for in people or uh, particularly older people and those who are on uh, statins for high cholesterol, um, and now is starting to be used in horses a little bit. Um, and uh, there's data in man about improved uh, improved motility. And a number of research studies have looked at adding to an extender and found some positive findings. So there. Now, what about if you feed horses? There's a study done uh, by. Uh, good friend of ours, Warwick Bailey, and, and some others at Washington State University. And they looked at seven Andalusian stallions. They gave them uh, a gram a day of the coenzyme Q10. And they had each horse, they would try to act as its own control. So uh, half the horses uh, didn't get the coenzyme Q10. They had a month um, as the as the 28 days when they were the control and they were given that. And then the other group had the supplement for a while and it was taken off. So uh, firstly, uh, they measured uh, plasma levels and uh, found that um, within 14 days, the levels increased. Um, and uh, so uh, in plasma, uh, so that was good. Uh, it was getting into the horse and then looked at the effect on, on, on viability. And here we've got, um, this was chilled semen uh, and then uh, chilled, then frozen. And so we, we've got here a significant effect in the supplemented horses on improved uh, viability. So it was a significant effect at 14 days um, in both of these uh, treatments. Now, amongst the group of seven stallions, there were five stallions that were considered subfertile with lower uh, motilities and viabilities. And this, here's a more complicated slide uh, where we've got a situation with um, uh, We've got uh, significant improvements in, um, in viability, uh, total motility and progressive motility from uh, 14 days after supplementation in both chilled semen or, or frozen semen. Uh, so these were less fertile stallions were supplemented. And what was interesting is they were only given the coenzyme Q10 for 28 days, but the, the benefits appeared to go on beyond that. So if you're going to supplement, uh, give a stallion the uh, fish oil, you've probably got to start about uh, two months out from the breeding season because we want that to be incorporated into the membranes of the, of the sperm and you've got this sort of 60 day sperm production cycle. But with the um, with an antioxidant and energy substrate like coenzyme Q10, you only need to give it two weeks before the breeding season. So it's something new. now. I've talked about some supplements. Be careful with excessive supplementation. Selenium can be toxic. And here was an interesting uh, study, uh, you know, 25 years ago, a Polish study looked at a group of horses where they fed a four times the calcium intake versus a control group for three months. And they got some significant reductions in various measures of, of semen quality and associated that with a reduction of levels of zinc which is an antioxidant, a component of antioxidants and, and copper in seminal plasma. So the increased calcium seemed to be leading to mineral interactions that was reducing antioxidant function in seminal plasma. So again, an, another example of, you know, if, if sort of one uh, feeding the requirement level is good, then feeding the three times the requirement level is not going to be good.
Heat stress, I'll just mention really briefly, heat stress has certainly been shown to uh, impact uh, stallions and it may affect both libido and fertility. It's quite variable, the same level of heat will affect horses differently. Uh, key thing here is probably managing the environment that the horse is in and keeping them cool, um, avoiding fever. You'll obviously all, all want to avoid fever in the stallion because that'll knock uh, semen around for a prolonged period. Uh, killing off, killing them off. Now, one nutrient that may help uh, combat heat stress that's used in other animals, and David Nash can talk more about that, is betaine. Um, wheat bran, uh, beet pulp are thought to be high in betaine, and there is a supplement that's used, but who knows how much to give to horses. So if you've got a horse that's uh, uh, troubled by heat stress, then, then look at the environmental uh, management things, but you may also look at, uh, look at betaine as well. So that's the end of um, end of my presentation on uh, nutrition and fertility uh, as it relates to the horse. Um, great source of information is our searchable library and uh, you can get onto Equinews and you can search for lots of things. There's 10,000, um, tens of thousands of articles uh, on there. There's also the sort of scientific proceedings of conferences that we've done. So there's a number there. And uh, if you're wanting specific advice about your horse, um, then uh, you can contact us um, uh, through uh, phone or email and uh, be happy to take uh, take your questions now or, uh, and um, yeah, get some to my esteemed panel members as well. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Pete, for that. Um, we do have a few questions that have come through. So, um, David, I might direct this one to you from Anna. Um, and she asks, when should I start preparing my mare nutritionally if she's had trouble conceiving in the past? Um, probably for me, and we discussed this on Campbell's comments on the weekend, was Probably if we're on the Southern Hemisphere breeding season, maybe look at April once you've decided. It gives you the opportunity to assess the horse's condition, but also get her checked out in veterinary as well. So that gives you enough time to um, assess body weight and condition score if she's lacking or over, we can adjust that. And pretty much go through everything that Pete's spoken about before. So maybe April next year, go and re-watch this, this webinar and get all the tips. Yeah, good point. Um, Pete, um, this one's probably a good one for you. So this is from Fiona and she she asks, um, well, she's had a mare that has slipped her foal quite late. Um, is there anything she could have done nutritionally or anything she should watch out for next time? Well, I guess that depends on, on why she slipped the foal. Um, so, uh, you know, a variety of reasons why that can happen. Um, we're sort of seeing new things all the time, you know, chlamydia emerging, caterpillars, uh, herpes, you know, most of the things won't necessarily relate to nutrition. But if it, if it related to placentitis or something like that, um, then, um, you know, maybe you would give some consideration to omega-3 fatty acids, for example. So really depends very much on, on the cause. You've got to uh, talk to your vet about the cause and and where mares um, do slip foals, uh, establishing the cause, you know, doing a PM on the foal, looking at the placenta is, is very important. So you, you know what's actually caused it. So plug for the vet. Yep, cool. Um, we've had a question come in from Taya um, and she's from France. So I don't know what time it is over there, but um, Pete or anyone can answer this. Um, she's asking, uh, as selenium can be toxic, would you suggest more vitamin E as it's less risky? Um, well, do you want to know the time in France, Beck? Is that, was that the first question? That was my question, yep. <laughs> 12, 12 30, I reckon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, selenium certainly toxic, but you don't see cases very often. So, I think you need to meet the nutrient requirements of, of both of them, but don't go overboard. And, um, and so selenium, you can, you can measure status uh, or you can get your nutritionist to do the calculations about intakes. You can measure levels in the forage. So knowing the area you're in or the, the level in the forage uh, and then look at uh, the diet. I mean, it's not toxic at 
two times the level, but maybe 10 times the uh, recommended daily allowance we might start to see toxicity. So selenium's relatively inexpensive nutrient, organic selenium more expensive than, um, than the synthetic selenium, uh, but um, vitamin E is quite expensive. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, don't go overboard with that, uh, but get the sort of right levels of both of them in the diet. Yep, cool. Um, Clarissa, I might get you to answer this one uh, from Alex, who has an obese mare with a history of laminitis um, and is due to fall in October, wanting to know what can what she can fit she or he can feed um, this mare and can they produce enough milk on a calorie uh, and low NSC restricted diet um, and her chances of getting back in full on this type of diet as well. All right, hi. So a obese laminitic mare probably um, has some level of insulin dysregulation, I would say. Um, so I'll go down that pathway. Essentially, um, yes, if they're obese, they can um, develop a healthy pregnancy and produce milk on a low NSC diet, provided they're fed a really good quality feed balancer that meets their nutrient requirements. Um, some natural source vitamin E would be helpful, um, long chain omegas in that diet. But yeah, you can, you can meet requirements on that diet. If they do need additional calories to um, produce milk, then we would be looking at adding oil or digestible fiber to the diet and keeping that sugar and starch intake low. Um, in terms of getting back into foal, it can be tricky, um, mainly because if they've got insulin dysregulation, there's a huge sort of a lot of endocrine pathways at play that can interfere with estrus cycles, etc. So EMS mares can be have longer cycles, it can be more difficult to get them in foal. So I guess the key factors are see if you can control their weight, um, exercise them if possible, um, supplement with long chain omega-3 fats. And then I guess if she's severely laminitic, maybe considering the ethics about whether you actually want to get her back into foal, because obviously the stress of carrying a, a, a foal and um, is going to really affect her her soundness and her demeanor. So yeah, ethics is a big one too. Yeah, good points. Um, and Beck, I was just going to make a comment there. Obesity is a pro-inflammatory state. They get in, increased inflammatory mediators, and therefore that can have an effect in the uterus or overduct just as Absolutely. in other parts of the body. Yeah, good point. Um, and Pete, this is the last question, so I'll put it to you. Um, Brown has got, uh, she's just moved to a property that's uh, with a fescue dominant pasture. Should she restrict access to this as she has several mares in foal? Uh, well, that depends upon the fescue. It depends upon the type of fescue. So type of fescue with high levels of an endophyte that have, um, can relate, um, can uh, lead to um, a number of disturbances in reproduction and, and milk production. So you get red bag, uh, delayed polling dates and reduced milk production, but it depends very much on the, there's also some fescue around that's fine. So you've really got to get the fescue assessed and what type it is, what type of fescue it is. Uh, in some of those circumstances, then maybe if you're unsure, you might have to increase uh, supplementation with with other nutrients so they eat, or other feeds so they eat less grass. But um, fescue is, a, you know, it's a big issue in the US. Um, it, it certainly happened here in Australia, uh, less common, less common, but uh, it, it, it can happen. But you can have uh, fescue that's low risk in that regard. Cool. Um, well, I think that's all of our questions. So what I might do, um, our next webinar in the series is on pasture management and water quality. Um, and this is on Wednesday, the 4th of August. So if you'd like to register for this one, I'll put the link in the chat box now. Um, but I'm actually going to hand over to David to introduce the topic um, as he'll be presenting that one. Yeah, thanks, Beck. So I'm going to speak on two important and probably often forgotten aspects of equine health or nutrition, and that's water, the first limiting nutrient, and pasture management, which we just ended up a couple of um, questions on. So 
what we look to discuss is various resources requirements for water, but also look at various parameters of water quality and what we should be aware of. So we've been actively out there looking at various studs water qualities and sort of getting a base level of what typical stud water qualities are in Australia. So we could we can explore those opportunities and, and results as well. Um, we'll also look at um, some of the pasture management tips and tools this year, whilst most of us are actually probably having a really good season in Australasia this year, um, we really need to be mindful that we can uh, manage our pastures better and use them as a quite a good nutritional tool. So, yep, like Beck said, um, 4th of August, it's 7 p.m. Hopefully I got that one right. And yep. uh, for everyone on there tonight, we'll get a, an email link to that and look out for our social media pages as well. Yep, perfect. Think. Perfect. Yep. So I've put that link in the chat box now if anybody is interested. Um, and yes, it will be in an email you guys will get uh, tomorrow as well. So uh, thank you everyone for attending this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with any of the team, if you have any further <laughs> questions, uh, please feel free to email advice at kr.com. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. And we'll now have the antioxidant properties of red wine demonstrated. Good one. <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> She's a healthy one. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, folks.